Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Stay in your lane, stay in your lane, stay in your lane. Welcome to the Mind Your Own Podcast with Aaron Sorensen and Sasha Durkin. Where we stick to sports, except when we're not. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mind Your Own Podcast. I'm Aaron. I'm Sasha. And it is the third mailbag edition of the Mind Your Own Podcast. I feel like it's like once a quarter. Ye- yeah, <laughs> I like that. It's like business terms. Once a quarter, we'll be diving into your questions. <laughs> uh, but it is the mailbag episode. We were going to do this actually in the previous episode, but then, you know, as always, topics come up. In fact, a topic has even come up today where we're like, oh, shoot, we want to talk about this. So we're just going to make it all work. We have yeah. a few really good questions from you all. So before we dive in, um, Sasha, how are you? Can you also tell me how it's already the end of July? I don't know. And I would like to put in a formal request to inquire as to why it is the end of July and we're nearly in August. I feel like summer just started. My stepson literally just got out of school and now he has to go back in like two weeks. Yeah, I'm just, I mean, fall camp is pretty much here. Everything kicks off very, very soon within days of recording this podcast. So I am trying to, I actually had this conversation with somebody. I just got back from big 10 media days and I was having this conversation with somebody that I am very cognizantly aware of my just limitations right now. Like Mm -hmm. as somebody who is a true introvert and the fact that I don't get my energy from being around people, Mm -hmm. I, I have to now kind of after sort of almost a year and a half of spending a lot of time alone almost recalibrate if you will because it is it is tough to suddenly then transition back into like I'm going to be um around people quite a bit and have to be uh on yeah if you will that's gonna be that's gonna be a little bit of an adjustment yeah that that is super difficult I think it's just difficult for everybody like even I mentioned this on a, a I don't know I can't remember Time is a, a flat circle, it's but all flat recently circle. mentioned that I'm like kind of in the middle, like I'm extroverted, but also I can be introverted, mostly extroverted. Like I like being around other people, but even to me, it's overwhelming. Yeah. I think it's just, it's really where you get your energy. And that's, that's the hard part is like, I, as somebody who like, I like being around people. Like I do, I just have to like, kind of be mindful of the fact that like, unfortunately, and this is not a slight to anyone. Like, I just don't get my energy by being around people. It drains me. I give a lot away in that, in that situation. So yeah, it's going to be a bit of an adjustment. I know we're all in it though. So I'm not, I'm not alone in this. It's just thoughts, thoughts and prayers to all of us. (laughs) Agreed. A hundred percent. Well, before we get started into the mailbag portion of this, this uh, episode did want to just kind of stop really quickly because we are now officially in the heart of the Olympics. We were kind of on the fence. If we would talk about the Olympics in this episode, or if we would do the mailbag and wait until the next episode for the Olympics. Well, the thing is the Olympics just want us to talk about them just a little bit now. Mm -hmm. Um, As we are recording this, a lot of this is still fairly unknown. So I want to be I, I do want to be clear by the time you are listening to this podcast, more, more may be understood. Uh, but as I was waking up this morning, I started to see the news of, because I knew that last night when, before this was recorded, the time difference would mean that we were all probably asleep when the gymnastics all around team competition was happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obviously shout out to the MVPs who either stayed up or woke up early to catch that. I, I just figured I'll watch it in prime time later. I don't mind spoilers. Don't bother me. So I Mm -hmm. I woke up, started to see that Simone was trending. I'm like, I don't know if that's a good thing. And all I saw was the first headline that Simone Biles is out of the women's Olympic gymnastics team final in Tokyo. It was quickly then people are trying to figure out. So like, I'm trying to figure out, did she get hurt? Like was, there was some misunderstanding of like, was she on the floor? Was she involved? Did something happen? I'm like, did she get injured? I'm trying to kind of understand because everything is really coming through just Twitter at this point. 
and um, the broadcast. So NBC started to say that Simone is, was not out with an injury, like a physical injury, but more of a mental health concern. Mm -hmm. Um, the booth did a good job. I want to speak clear on underlining why that was important, because as we're having this conversation, being clear and concise with this messaging is vital. Mm -hmm. So as the morning continues, I tweet mental health is full health, full stop, or mental health is health full stop. Um, but then we have a little bit more clarity. They had a press conference where Simone said she had no idea, no idea where she was in the air after her vault. She felt her head wasn't in it and feared she might get hurt and spoil her teammates' mental chances if she continued. So clearly she was listening to her mental health. She mm -hmm. understood that something wasn't right and decided even if she physically felt okay, she was going to remove herself. And her team did end up uh, meddling. They received silver. That is fantastic. The uh, Russian uh, contingency who does not compete as Russia, they compete as like the Olympic team of, I don't even remember what it is, uh, yeah. but anyway, they won gold. Uh, great in Britain had a great showing won bronze, like very exciting. I do want to be clear, like go to hell to everyone who has currently written a headline. That's like, they have settled for silver. You don't settle for Olympic right. medals. That right. is not how this goes. Um, I understand that the United States has dominated in uh, gymnastics for a very long time. Getting a silver medal is not some falling from the pedestal, like right. stop with that. Like, and then I saw somewhere it was like, they, they settled for s silver with, you know, Simone's absence. I'm like, don't do that because this is so important. Just one day prior to all of this, Simone posted a couple of photos on Instagram and this was her caption. It wasn't an easy day or my best, but I got through it. I truly do feel like I have the weight of the world on my shoulders at times. I know I brush it off and make it seem like pressure doesn't affect me, but damn, sometimes it's hard. And then she laughs. The Olympics are no joke, but I'm happy my family was able to be with me virtually. They mean the world to me. I just want to repeat this one little piece of this. I truly do feel like I have the weight of the world on my shoulders at times. I know I brush it off and make it seem like the pressure doesn't affect me, but damn, sometimes it's hard. One day later, she makes the decision to remove herself mm -hmm. from the team competition because she was realizing that she may be the reason that her team doesn't potentially medal, yeah. doesn't medal where, you know, maybe they could at that point. I just, I've seen responses. Some are awful. I'm not going to give any time or attention yeah. to them. But I just want to point this one tweet out that I liked. It was it was somebody and I'm not going to say their Twitter handle because oftentimes like unless I have their full like this is this is not a journalist who tweeted this. I just want to be clear. This was somebody who is just somebody yeah. who's not looking to be put on like all of this attention uh, from our podcast. So I do always want to be careful like when we credit things like I always credit stories, journalists, but I'm not always going to do that with uh just somebody's personal Twitter account because right. I, that's not cool. Anyway, this person to paraphrase basically said, um, you know, Simone had said she felt like the entire Olympics was on her shoulder. All everything for the United States was on. Her. Um, she was forced to essentially whether, you know, it's not about anyone else. You can, you, you put this pressure on yourself too, but she felt forced to carry that weight alone which is something that's just entertainment for the rest of us. And mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, you know, like taking and, you know, and taking the ability to step back and say like, I am not okay. I am not okay. Like right. my mental health is not in a place right now where I cannot continue. Sasha, you said this uh, on Twitter, your brain is a muscle, right? There's people that spend like lots of time in the gym and train their muscles or on some kind of fitness journey. But like the thing that I feel like everybody or the majority of people, it seems like when mental health is brought up, they're like, Oh, just like buck up. Well, your brain is a muscle. It also needs to be taken care of just like the rest of your body and your internal mm -hmm. organs. And if anything, it probably should have more attention because it literally runs everything <laughs> that your body is yeah. doing. Um, I did see someone and I don't remember where, which platform it was on, but that mentioned, you know, 
what happens if, and then she ended up saying it herself in the press conference, Simone did, but like, what happens if like, she's not on and she falters in some way, like the results of that could be catastrophic, like leading to like not being able to compete at all for a significant amount of time because she gets severely injured. Like that's, (laughs) that's something that I, I don't think that the greater, the greater public takes into account. Like you're, you're, Gymnastics is not easy, I guess is what my point is. And if you're not fully like there, you don't feel it mentally, you're not present in the moment or you're distracted in some way, you could get very, very severely injured. So I don't know if this was the tweet you saw, but my friend Caroline yeah, actually had tweeted like, imagine if she had continued, imagine while throwing herself through the air wall with all of her strength and power, which by the way, she has a lot of strength and power. Yeah. She faltered or doubted herself. It would have been catastrophic. And here's the other piece that like we could spend an entire episode on Simone Biles. And like, maybe we should, because especially when we talk about, like we have spoken about Naomi Osaka mm-hmm. and like her, my computer is like ready to take flight. Um, (laughs) It is fired up to you as well, but like, it is important because this, this is something where I will say Alexa Ross, she um, is a sports anchor reporter, a big fan of her work. She tweeted Simone Biles didn't just hold the weight of the world on her shoulders for the sport. She competed through her trauma as a survivor and carried the burden of every other survivor out there to hold the USAG accountable if you did not by chance watch NBC's coverage on, on Sunday night of this, go look up NBC's. I can go find it and link it in the show notes. I'll, I'll, I will do the work for you all. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll find it and link it because it's worth watching. Um, NBC did a, did a small little piece, little package on Simone and talking about her experience through, um, also like admitting to herself, admitting to her family that she had been, um, sexually abused mm-hmm. a part of that horrific uh, discovery that this was happening in United States gymnastics with um, I don't even like to say his name so I'm not going yeah. to um, he doesn't deserve the attention um, but the fact that like so many people fumbled on this of like when people came forward and said this this was happening to me the amount of times women were not being listened to Simone in that package made a comment where I was like damn that to feel that pressure where she Mm -hmm. felt like if she didn't keep competing, if she didn't come back and use her platform, which she knows is sizable, people would ignore this story and they would brush by to the next thing. She had this weight on her. That's not just carrying the sport of gymnastics itself, Mm -hmm. but is carrying the weight of changing the way that the sport is run, the way that people, um, the people in charge are held accountable. She felt like she needed to still be ever present in this because if she left, what would happen? And this came from the New York times profile on her, but so the New York times wrote this little piece and this is just a, and I'll, I'll link this as well, but I just want to read this in the many months leading to the summer, some Leading to the summer, Simone Biles couldn't wait for the Tokyo Olympics, not for them to start, but for them to end. The weight she has carried as the face of the sport has become a burden, and the wear and tear on her body had become what she called unreal, with the pain in her ankles making every excruciating step a reminder of how unforgiving gymnastics can be. In a telephone interview about a week before leaving for the Tokyo Games, she was asked to name the happiest moment of her, of her career. Honestly, probably my time off, she said. Yeah. Now, if you're somebody who's listening going, well, then just quit. Don't do the sport. That is not, that is not the answer here. We have now laid out for you that Simone is the greatest of all time in this sport. She is, by the way, judged unfairly for the skills that she throws. She is judged against herself while others are judged against like she is like on such a different level that people aren't even judging big against her. Like she is so far and above that they're like, well, we don't, they, like, they aren't, they aren't judging her skills to the degree that they need to. And she also, like I said, came back for the fact that she knew if she could use her platform and her voice, maybe she could make a change within this sport for those, the generations to come. And she's going to, she's going to leave a lasting legacy, but gosh, If you are somebody right now who's trying to make some kind of comparison between what Carrie Shrug did, where she did the vault with the ankle or leg injury versus this, like 
I, I'm, we have to stop. Like we're, I, I was saying this earlier today that we have a habit of celebrating people fighting through some kind of pain. And I'm not comparing one to the other physical and mental health. Like you can look at an ankle injury and go, "Mm." it's broken or it's, it's injured or it's sprained. You can't see inside someone's brain to know what they're going through. No. And asking somebody, no matter what it is, physical or mental to fight through something, because that is a sign of strength is just absolutely bonkers. It is not what we should be it, it is, it is not a healthy thing to be showing mm-hmm. children. It is not a healthy thing for ourselves. Sometimes you just need to take a step back and be like, you know what? I'm not okay. And for whatever reason that might be, I need to, I need to take time. I need to take a day away. I need to rest. I feel like I'm just going to do this. Like if you have not listened to the meathead test kitchen podcast with Stady and Sasha, they touch on a lot of these topics. And I really go encourage you to go listen. They do a monthly mental health check, but like when we talk about mental health and sports, so often people think about rest days from mm-hmm. a physical aspect, but don't think about rest days from a mental health yep. aspect. And what Simone did to me is the greatest thing she's ever done. It is the biggest symbol of a goat in my, in my perspective, because when someone like Simone can say, I'm not okay. And I have to take myself out of this, this thing that I have trained so hard for, because I am going to hurt my team, but I could also hurt myself. Mm -hmm. That is, that is goat status. That is far more than anything else she's ever done. I think that just, (laughs) being able to recognize the fat and paying enough attention to what you're, what's going on internally, not just externally is the biggest sign of strength that any human being can possess Mm -hmm. being on, like you said, like being on her level, recognizing that, you know, something bad could happen. Negative, like something negative could happen if she continued going forward, I think is a bigger sign of strength than fighting through something and actually physically getting injured. Mm -hmm it's not, it's it's not worth it. It's not worth it. She is, she is the greatest of all time that won't change. And I also encourage people to really reflect on if you're somebody that likes to look at the downfall of athletes. And I said this earlier today too, before this podcast, a lot of the time, a lot of the celebration and of like of an athlete faltering is when they're an athlete of color. I mean, just to see like the people who like, were like kind of making jokes at Naomi Osaka's uh, expense because she's now out of the, um, Olympics and kind of like, I mean, the the internet brings out the worst of people. So I don't want to make it seem like this is what everyone is saying. It's definitely not, but I just, I, I get really like sad when I watch people celebrate the downfall of someone like they, they look at someone like LeBron James and they want him to fail. They look at Mm -hmm. someone, um, I remember, I remember Gabby Douglas in the the last Olympics when people wanted her to like basically fail to prove some point that she didn't deserve her spot. And it's just like, why do we do this? Why? And I use we as the greater we, but it's just like, I know the answer. There's so, there's so much that's tied up into that. And it's so, it's a lot of our own personal insecurities that are coming out and and manifesting in other ways. Yes. There's systemic racism that's built into a lot of this systemic misogyny that is built into a lot of this. Um, but yeah, we could do an entire episode on this, but we promised a mailbag episode. So yeah. here's what we'll do. Go check out Meathead Test Kitchen and listen to some of those episodes on mental health and how it how it is so vital within physical health. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to this. <laughs> it's the third episode every month. And a couple months ago, we actually <laughs> spent the entire episode talking about the necessity and the paying attention to of your brain when you need a mental health day. Yeah. So, so go, so go spend some time, go spend some time with mental health kit, mental health <laughs> meathead test kitchen. Oh my gosh. My brain is mental just health like, kitchen is what we mental should health kitchen. To. Oh my gosh. Um, but go check out meathead test kitchen. We will come back to this topic because yeah. here's the thing we'll have more, we'll have more that we'll be able to share more time to prepare and we can, we can offer hopefully a little bit more insight heading into heading into this topic going forward. But it is time for the mailbag and we have some really great questions. So kind of keeping in the sim- similar vein of the Olympics, Greg, Greg Smith, our own, 
Hale Varsity's own Greg Smith asks, what is your Gregory? favorite? Gregory. Gregory, what is your favorite <laughs> Olympic performance that you've watched? Now, he did not specify if he meant of like in time. 2021 or yeah. of all time. I think it can go whatever direction we want. Um, my answer, um, there's so many. One of my favorite answers, though, is probably Michaela Maroney. I think that was the 2012 Olympics when she uh, did the vault and stuck it. And it was just like, not only did she just completely stick that landing, but she like made a point to everyone of like, I deserve to be here and don't say otherwise. And I loved that moment. I've, I've watched that moment on YouTube more times than I care to admit. (laughs) I think my favorite from this Olympics, I got chills because I've never seen anything more perfect in my, that I can remember, but, um, Thomas Daly and Maddie Lee's dive. Holy Mm. guac. It was just absolutely perfectly freaking executed. And like, I, I, I hate it when people are like, Oh, it's just diving. Anyone can do that. I'm like, no, 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 no. No. They want to be in the Olympics. If everyone could do it, it was just absolutely beautiful. I think yeah. that's my favorite of, of this Olympics so far. There are several, but that that's the one that I thought of immediately when I saw this question. There's been so many, like good, so many good swimming events where oh, yeah. um, there's been, there's been wins out of lane eight, which like, if you are not like a swimming fan, like, let's, let me tell you if you, if, if somebody wins gold out of lane eight, like that is a big deal because the outside lanes are typically your like, I mean, it's so close in the Olympics to begin with. It's mm-hmm. not like astronomical differences between who's in the middle lanes versus the outside lanes, but like you definitely do have a harder time because you're getting everyone else's wake on mm-hmm. the outside. So like, to come in to get a gold medal on the outside lanes is like outstanding. Um, there've been some, like, I I mean, there's just been some like heartbreaking moments with swimming, but also some outstanding messages or outstanding moments in swimming. I will say this is like one of my favorite moments from the, uh, opening ceremonies of this Olympics. And if you haven't seen the video, it's I'll go, if I remember, I'll go link it, but who knows by the time I go, (laughs) <laughs> put the show notes together that I might forget. Uh, it's not hard to find. It's obviously being hosted in Japan. We know Japan has been very nervous, very upset about hosting these Olympic games with COVID-19 still really, really ravaging their country and the world. Um, and so there's just these little moments where you see the respect of the athletes for um, the many people that are working the many Japanese people working to make this possible, to make this Olympics possible. And during the opening ceremonies, and this may have happened with other teams, like just the one that was really well noticed on TV Mm -hmm. was as Ireland came in, they all stopped as a group. They set their flag, like they set the pole on the ground and they all turned to the Japanese hosts that were welcoming people and they bowed to them as a sign of respect for them what they are doing obviously bowing is a sign of respect in Japanese culture and that was really cool that that was a moment of like why the how what makes the Olympics great is this moment of like appreciation for one another Mm -hmm. and what makes us the same and what makes us different and what makes us makes our culture special um I thought that was really cool. That one stood out to me. And like I said, I'll, I'll go try to find the the video I was watching, but I've seen it multiple places at this point. So it was like all over Twitter. I think that night that they yeah. aired them, but it was pretty cool. It was really cool. I'm now like looking through like all time Olympic greats, but <laughs> it's fun. Like I want to hear all of yours. So if you have one, shoot us and you shoot us shoot us a tweet you can tweet at us at aaron sorensen at sasha 72 um let me did i get that right what your twitter handle oh yeah (laughs) so what's funny about that is that's going to play into our last question um sky is already there's a drinking game that's coming up and this that one was already one of them so yeah off to a great start (laughs) all right so next question i i like this question quite a bit tyler asked about the thoughts on the diversity of individuals asking questions at Big Ten Media Days. I love the junior journalist questions, for example. They were so deep. Um, so here's just a little insider information into how these kind of things work. Mm-hmm. Um, when you, so they only get so much time. Each coach got 15 minutes of, so that 15 minutes 
that you see, by the way, like they do a whole separate hour at a different podium, but you're not seeing all of that on TV, but that 15 minutes that they're at the main stage podium, that is for their opening comments. Some coaches are much more long winded. Yeah. Um, and that's also for their questions. So because of that, there are people in this crowd, which this setup was very different. It was in a big, uh, it was in a big stadium. We were spread out pretty far from one another. So the people who are trying to get the microphone around, I mean, they were like, they probably walked miles <laughs> during big 10 media days. Um, but not everyone gets their questions answered. So like the person who's facilitating it is looking out into the crowd. They're seeing hands go up. Um, they're doing their best. Now there are some questions that I don't want to say it like this, but to be fair, they're planted. Yeah. Like the junior journalists, they definitely gave them the space to ask those questions because, um, an eight-year-old's hand isn't like flying super high into the air in yeah. a big stadium. So like they knew um, one of the, one of the junior journalists asked uh, Michigan state's coach, like basically like, Hey, your record last year wasn't so good. Uh, like, how do you plan on like, basically like, how do you, how do you like get excited? Or so, he, he asked something along the lines of like, how do you keep getting excited about the new season whatever? And I loved uh, Michigan state's coach was like, thank you for reminding me of that. But great question. <laughs> um, I love, I love, uh, representation. We obviously know that from this podcast, I think allowing junior journalists, the opportunity to speak and have that moment is just really good for them. Mm -hmm. It helps build their confidence, but that's the case even for adults. I, I really love when I hear, um, people from all different walks of life asking questions. And that could be, it doesn't just need to be, sometimes we get so focused on like the people who've been doing something in an industry the longest or mm -hmm. people who just work for the papers. But then you start to hear somebody who has started their own blog and they've worked their way to being there. And like that representation to me is really cool because you yeah. then get a wide and vast uh, grouping of questions versus maybe the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So that, that was, that was just my, I, I mean, the more, I guess like I've always felt like this way, the more um, representation is in the audience, the more representation you're going to see in the questions. And so like, yeah. that's why when, you know, we, we look at hiring practices, like being able to be, and that's not always going to be the case, like, but like making sure you have a diverse pool of applicants so that you do get those absolutely best highest qualified individuals, because that, I think that just makes everyone better. So yeah, Tyler, well, I, I really think, like that question. <laughs> I think that the information too, like somebody is going to ask something that everybody has been wondering about, but either doesn't think to ask it. If you know, if you run out of time, you know, there's just so many things that happen like in that, that little window of time that, that having a more diverse group of people to ask questions may answer like some fan out there who's wanted to have that, you know, question answered. Mm -hmm. I just think you get a more diverse information out too, when you have a more diverse pool of people asking questions. Absolutely. No, I love that. I, you know, I think the more that we can, we can keep encouraging, um, people to get into this industry, the better. So those junior journalists are, were super fun. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they also ask the best questions because they, yeah. they really, in their opinion, have nothing to lose. Cause it's like at the end of the right. day, I'm going back it's to my elementary filtered. school. So right. see you later. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. These next two questions kind of go hand in hand. I'm going to use the first one to kind of give some context to the second, but Randy wants to know how long until Texas blows <laughs> up the SEC. Okay. Now this Wait, isn't this just ticking down. <laughs> This isn't a part of the second, this isn't the second question, but like, um, Brandon Vogel also of Hill varsity chimed in was like, what about Kansas? Well, he just said yeah. Kansas because I had made jokes that somebody needed to ask at big 10 media days, like about Kansas, because mm -hmm. at the time everything was a rumor. Everything was, Hey, it sounds like Texas and Oklahoma are trying to leave the big 12 and to go to the sec. Well, just so you know, as of the night before we recorded this podcast, uh, Oklahoma and Texas had officially uh, requested yep. to leave the Big 12 once they're like joint media, whatever. They're not going to basically renew it, which is in 2024, 2025. They just to be clear, they're not going to get that far. Like you aren't going to play four more seasons in a conference like that would mm -hmm. be absolutely <laughs> terrible. Um, 
Then the morning that we are recording this podcast, they released another joint statement. And I'm really enjoying seeing where these joint statements, like one is coming from Oklahoma, one is coming from Texas. It's really fun. Uh, The University of Oklahoma and the University of Texas, Texas at Austin sent the attached request to the Southeastern Conference Commissioner Greg Sankey this morning. The joint request seeks an invitation for membership in in the SEC starting July 1st, 2025. They're not going to wait that long. Mm -mm. The two universities look forward to the prospect of discussions regarding that matter. Now, I did see some tweets that were pretty funny where someone was like, imagine the pettiness of the SEC is like, thanks so much for your interest, but uh, no, thank you. And now (laughs) we're exploring other candidates. (laughs) We're exploring (laughs) options like Kansas. Um, No, it's, I mean, they're going to get accepted. You don't, you don't do this. Like Nebraska didn't like leave the big 12 for the big 10 without explicitly knowing that the big 10 was going to be like, yeah, come on in. It's one of those things where like, they're going to, uh, yeah, they're just going to kind of like say, oh, thank you so much for your interest. We're going to think about it as we get our lawyers involved and figure out how do we get that 2025 down to 2022. Mm-hmm. Um, so <laughs> to Randy's question, how long until Texas blows up the SEC? Look, Texas joined the Big 12, what, 1998? It beca- the Big 8 yeah. became the Big 12 in 1998. Is that right? I or is it 1996? Correct. No, isn't when did big 12 form (laughs) (laughs) um it's either it's an even number uh was it 96 1996 okay so i I always like that the uh nebraska's 97 championship is the sandwich piece of this and i'm always (laughs) trying to remember if it was on the on a bookend or if it was anyway 1996 um obviously uh that was a controversial situation because what was the original members of um you had oh gosh i'm looking at the membership right now woof um (laughs) but yeah you had iowa state kansas kansas state oklahoma oklahoma state nebraska colorado missouri that was where you're eight at some point you had then texas uh baylor texas a&m and who was the fourth Texas school? What? Who am I forgetting? Does any of it matter? Do any of any? No, of I don't think matters? it matters. No. Um. Was it Texas Tech? It was Texas. I Tech. want to say Texas. It was Texas Tech. My brain. There's too many because then they got TCU. Yeah. So that's where my brain is like. Well, was like came? it wasn't TCU. <sighs> too much too much of this none of it matters anymore which actually this does my entire like my my whole thinking (laughs) thing here does play into the second question that we got so anyway 1996 uh that would be what 25 years that the big 12 existed in the way that it did yeah so i guess you could based on history you could say that texas has roughly 25 years to see how long so maybe if this is a game can Texas yeah. can Texas bring the SEC can to the Texas ground succeed in, in less, destroying the SEC in 25 years in less than 25 years in do less it, than yeah. do it in less time do it in 15 mm-hmm. do it in two do it in two <laughs> actually do it before you even get officially yeah, like, introduced just, now I know like Texas A&M is like excuse the way I'm going to say the shitting bricks right now, because they're like, we didn't ask for this. Wait a minute. We, we were the ones who voted against it. We tried to get away from Texas. We don't want this. Like, mm-hmm. honestly, if like Nebraska woke up tomorrow and found out like Texas was trying to come to the big 10, like obviously Nebraska would be like, hold up. Okay. Bye. No, thank you. <laughs> so I get where Texas A&M is coming from. It's like, we, yeah. we left you. We're not interested in being part of this with you now. This is unrelated to Texas, but I just want to say in the long run, the school that ended up looking like the absolute genius in all of this, people are going to focus on what Nebraska did when it contacted the Big Ten and what Missouri did when it contacted the SEC and blah, 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 blah. I'm just going to go back to this nearly a decade later. Colorado was the big winner here Mm. because when Colorado (laughs) saw all of this happening Mm -hmm. in 2010, 2009, 2010, they looked around and were like, this doesn't look good for us. <laughs> um, instead of waiting and finding out the whole like mess around and find out, we are not going to mess around. We're going to just give the pack what was the pack 10 a quick phone call mm. and say like, look, something's happening and we don't like it. Yeah. Can we come hang out with you now. And the pack 10 is like, cool. That Absolutely. Makes sense. Do you Geniuses. want to form an alliance? 
Right. It is 100% that. Yes, do you I want do. to? Good, good, good. <laughs> yep. Nope. It's that. Colorado is the geniuses of this whole mess. Mm. Um, they were so smart. They got the heck out much, of Dodge. Much to Nebraska fans chagrined. Colorado was the winner. <laughs> Colorado is the winner because no one's talking about Colorado nope. today. <laughs> like no one's like, hey, you remember when Colorado left? Everyone's like, remember when Missouri and Texas and now went to the SEC and then Nebraska went to the Big Ten? Like, why is Nebraska so quiet these days? Does it? <laughs> Literally, no one is talking about Colorado. Colorado's well, in the Pac-12. Like we, we don't know. We don't. We're they're doing the Mariah Carey. Like I don't know her. Yeah, I've I don't never, know I've are. never known them. <laughs> like as far as Colorado is concerned, they've never heard of the Big Twelve. They don't know any of these teams. They're happy where they're at. Chip and the Buffalo are just living their best lives. Yeah. They do not care about any of this. So this goes to Adam's question. <laughs> Something he has been thinking about lately. I'm just gonna read it. Something I have been thinking about lately, that college football is going to change forever in the next couple of years. He says he's 43, so I grew up where there was only one or two games on the television every year. I said television, he said TV. I just made it sound like my, like, real old timey. On the television each year. I'm sorry, Adam, you did not type it like that. Leave it at telly. I have fond memories of hanging around the house on a fall Saturday, listening to the game on the radio, listening to Nebraska, Pummel, Iowa State, or Kansas, the two big games of the year that were on TV, and it was a big deal to get to get, get together with the friends and family and watch those games. We lived through the glory years and the fall. I've always loved college football for its traditions, the conferences, the rivalries, the cupcake games, bowl games, etc. you name it. Of course, it has been going away has been going this way for years, but it seems now we are in the final stages of college football, basically becoming a pro league driven by profits and power only. Some of it is good, like the playoffs and name, image, and likeness, but all the other things that make college football unique are now out the window. Always a Husker and will always root for and watch the team, but college football, as we know, it is laying in a hospital bed surrounded by close family and a religious leader, leader of their choice. I didn't even read that the first time. Just wondering your take, and if you think the overall direction of the sport is something you're looking forward to, or if you'll be glancing back every now and then and wondering what happened to the uniqueness of college football. I really enjoy that question. I do too. Thank you. So I will say, because people always look at me and go, you're so young. You don't know any of this. I did grow up in, I grew up, I knew what he's talking about with Mm -hmm. the football Saturdays where you listened on the radio. Um, I, I mean, I experienced all of that too. Like we all did. Like we kind of grew up in a time period where like some games were on the radio. There's the pay-per-view era. Um, yeah. I was alive for the big eight and lived the big eight. Like, I want to be clear. Like I was alive to know what happened when like Texas and all of those schools joined and made the big 12. So like, thank you for thinking I'm so young. Um, thank you for thinking we are so young. Um, but like we lived through this too. So like, I get it. And yeah, I, you know, that was like the thing that I missed most in 2020 was the like excitement around college athletics. And I'm not just talking college football, but like all of those little things that make college athletics just a little bit special from the mascots to the band, to the cheer yeah. team, to the dance team, to the fans, to this, like all of that was really special, but it is changing. And my honest answer is I don't think, and by the way, Adam made it clear. He thinks playoff, the playoffs and NIL are a good thing. Mm -hmm. I agree. I don't think the NIL stuff. I don't think the playoffs are changing college football in a way. I think it's, I think it's potentially what these super conferences will do. Yeah. I think it's what is going to happen is when we talk about like what the big eight meant and like, okay. (laughs) this this and i'll like i'll pass it to you for a second sasha because my brain is just like rambling words now but when nebraska joined the big 10 and all of these schools were like what is nebraska and you why why isn't it you and and like northwestern university is in you it's really hard to explain like think about the original big eight nu ku ksu ou osu isu um mu Mm -hmm. cu got them Got them all. Got them. Um, it was a thing in yeah. the big, it was a b- thing in the big eight, all of those schools. It's not Kansas university. It's the university of Kansas. They were yeah. still KU. Yeah. Um, Iowa state is probably the only one Iowa state and Oklahoma state are probably the only ones that like actually follow the sequence, but like right. it's the university of Oklahoma, not Oklahoma university, but they go by OU. OU. 
it was just a thing in the big eight. That's just what it was. And so like, there are these little things, these little pieces, these little nuggets of history that like were tied together because mm -hmm. of these conferences and like their, the history within them that like are being diluted as conferences change as they right. realign. And I think that is probably what makes me sad sometimes is mm -hmm. to see those things disappear. That like the individualness of the conferences, you know, like back in the day, I, I mean, I'm, I just turned 37, not that long ago. So I'm not like young, but I'm not old either. Um, but that's I do, how we all are not, know, old, right? not young. We're just living. I'm an old soul. <laughs> we'll put it that way. Um, I do, I do miss, you know, how, how football used to be, but I'm also very excited to see what the new landscape of college football looks like with these super conferences. I think honestly with super conferences, it allows for, I don't want to say more level playing field, but honestly, I think that that's what it lends itself to. You don't have, you know, like uh, I'm going to use the big eight because, you know, that's where we're at, but you know, like it's not as like regional, like two, like it's only the Midwest teams, you know, like you're not just going straight down a map, like they're kind of scattered throughout. And I, I, I think that that's kind of exciting to me just to see how the game itself evolves because of that, because you've got, mm -hmm. um, just different coaching styles. I mean, you go to any different conference and, and the coaching styles are pretty different for the most part, but then kind of starting to blend some of that stuff together and seeing like these super hybrid coaching styles, I think is going to be very interesting. Um, I, I, maybe I'm being too much of an optimist, but I think with NIL and expanded playoff, like these just gigantic, I honestly see like these just like gigantic super conferences. You have probably four is what I end up like kind of what I'm seeing like in the future. Not that I know anything about anything, but that's kind of what I see like the direction of things going. But I feel like it levels itself out a little bit more, especially yeah. with NIL. I don't think that you've got, and, and honestly, like as NIL starts playing out and as these realignments are happening, I think that more like legislation and a little bit more structure comes in play with that so mm -hmm. that you don't have power grabs. I hope not. It's definitely like, you know, as conference realignment continues, because it's mm -hmm. going to, like, yep. we're going to get to a point where like I know the Big Ten made a comment that it's not going to just go seek out schools and programs right. for the sake of doing it and I agree with that like I don't think you need to go get someone for the sake of it I I do disagree with some people who like if I if I were the Big Ten I would have my eyes kind of set on like I obviously Notre Dame is the favorite like people mm -hmm. want Notre Dame I yeah. think that could make a lot of sense in the Big Ten but like I'm not opposed to a couple of schools like Kansas and Iowa State I think with the rivalry between Iowa and Iowa State mm -hmm. I actually think Iowa would be the most against bringing yeah. Iowa state in, yeah. but like, in my opinion, I think Iowa and Iowa state could then have that, have the Cyhawk rivalry right yeah. in the conference, Kansas spare me on the, but with the football team, have you seen the basketball team? <laughs> right. uh, the basketball team could definitely be a great fit as far mm -hmm. as, um, what it could do in the big 10, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, there's a couple of teams where like, I would, if I'm the big 10, I hope they're at least just like they've highlighted that yeah. we know, we know Notre Dame is like highlighted circle heart <laughs> drawn around it, like every which way to Sunday. But like, if there's any other schools, I would probably be like keeping an eye on a couple. Um, because I think, so I have a point here, but yeah. like when, when Nebraska was trying to play in 2020 mm -hmm. and people really wanted to leave the big 10 and was like, oh, let's go back to the big 12. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, Why? I really, I really hated the idea for a lot yeah. of reasons, but I'm going to tell you two. The first was the big 12 is not, was not, is not what Nebraska left. Like it, the, the, like the feeling of like getting back something isn't there. Like right. it's not there anymore. It's the Nebraska same conference anymore. No, it looks different. <laughs> I mean, West Virginia and TCU, there's right. teams that weren't there before. Um, but Nebraska has spent a decade trying to find some footing in the Big Ten and has in a lot of ways. Like Nebraska fits really, really well. Like the the Nebraska Medical Center is like a shining star in the mm -hmm. Big Ten. Um, they 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 work so well in that space. I know we don't care about academics and all that stuff, but like we should. Um, 
but then like volleyball has found a really good home right. baseball well um there's there's so many sports that have I mean even basketball is doing all right in the big 10 I understand men's basketball has kind of had its um you know it's it's not been a smooth path but you know there's potential this year that right. they could do fairly well um I I've started to kind of view the big I remember when Nebraska and this is my point excuse me I remember when Nebraska went into the Big Ten that first season thinking, like, will we ever feel like Nebraska belongs here? Will it ever feel like, as I'm covering this team, like, there's something about, like, will I be excited to travel mm-hmm. to these places? Will will the newness wear off, and will I just be like, I'm excited for these things? And the answer is a decade in, yes. I look forward to going to Columbus because they have a really good donut shop called Buckeye Donut. Um, live for Buckeye Donuts. Mm-hmm. So good. The very first time I had it was in a food truck that they had right outside of the stadium. It was so good. I love the history of the fact that Memorial Stadium, Nebraska's Memorial Stadium, was actually um, crafted to a degree off of what Ohio State Stadium looks like. They saw that you see the same like architecture in mm-hmm. some places. I think that's really cool. Um, jump around at Wisconsin has actually become not even so much about like the coolness of it if you will but right. it's like fun for me in the press box to set my gla- i always go fill my glass up now with soda and set it on so i can just watch it shake yeah um i i really enjoy like i think about like i just think about all the like little things about these different schools i've been to that i'm like i remember walking into the big house for the first time and people who are like oh it's not impressive but like for some reason i got to stand in this one hallway in the depths of it and i was like this is just so cool like this is just so cool like the history of this and like it's taken a decade to kind of have these little like things and if i'm feeling that way i imagine others are too and i imagine as a team you start to kind of feel a sense of familiarity yeah. in places. And, you know, when we talk about this, Adam, when we look at your question and kind of, I think where you're really hitting at is like, will the, like that special feeling still exist in all of this? And the answer in my opinion is yes. Mm-hmm. We're just going to have to continue finding them and we're going to have to continue sort of evolving right. with it and like changing but the beauty of college sports was never was never going to be impacted if an athlete could make some money off of their name, image, and likeness. Right. It was never going to be impacted if it was the BCS or the playoffs. What makes college sports so special is what it, what it means to so many of us. Yeah. Where we have our alma maters. We have the things that like we look forward to about these college towns. I don't think that's going to change even through this, mm-hmm. even if it just maybe feels a little bit different. One thing that I was told very early on in my broadcasting career, which I think is super important to note here, is you may have had something special at the time, whether that be that conference, whether that be that show, whether that be that job, but going home rarely ever works out the way that everybody thinks it will. The idea and the memories are there, but going back home is never the same. I say Mm -hmm. that like in greater context, just because in theory, yes, the memories you have attached to the way that things used to be are great, but that's why they're memories Mm -hmm. because they live in that timeframe. If you go back home and revisit it, it's not going to be or feel the same. That's the evolution of college sports in general. That's just how it is. I mean, that's such a good way of putting it because I would say college football isn't on its final life, final lifeline. I would almost right. view college. I would view college athletics as a, a brand new one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a cat. It's got nine lives. It's going to keep coming back. It's going to keep adapting and evolving and finding new ways. And we're going to keep getting excited. We're going to keep showing up on game days, uh, whether that's for football or volleyball or basketball or tennis or soccer. Like, I don't care. Name your favorite sport at your, you know, at your, favorite institution here like you're gonna still like find the things and I think now that I'm saying this out loud the biggest thing that you're gonna find is the athlete it's the Mm. students it's the the individuals who make up the game that don't change and there's still gonna be those amazing stories that you're gonna look at and be like 
wow, this person exists. Like this thing exists in this space. Like this, this story is a living thing within this, this bigger, broader team. And those things don't change. And so, um, to your question, Adam, I think I'm looking forward to seeing how it continues to adapt just because at this point, I don't think it can get any kookier. Um, but it always proves me wrong. But I'm excited because the things that don't change are the people. The things that don't change are the um, elements of it. Like I said, the things like the mascots and the bands, although like, you you know, every so often a new little red comes along and then you just get to add him to the lineup. It's fine. We look at it this way. Little red was a big deal in the (laughs) nineties. But now we just, we just get to see two mascots on the sidelines on every fall. So it's cool. Right. right? The overgrown man child and as somebody on TikTok said, the cowboy guy. The cowboy guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, with the last few minutes we have of this podcast, we are going to uh, spend just a little time on Sky's drinking, drinking game. game. <laughs> and I called him a snarky butt because he is. Um, all right. He said, if you made a drinking game based on listening to an episode of the Mind Your Own podcast, what what rules would you add? I'm going to read what he has so far. Now he he sent multiple emails following up from listening to episodes. And I feel, I just want to say, I feel attacked, Mm, mm -hmm. but I also respect it. (laughs) So he said so far, drink anytime Aaron says the phrase in for the record, which fine. Uh, I I need to add one to that already. Or to be clear, to be clear. Yes. We need to make uh we need to make merch that's just like <laughs> and for the record to be, clear, to be clear maybe make some stickers some t-shirts just ex like <laughs> expletives but no <laughs> no uh, y'all expletives <laughs> y'all we'll get to that one he brought that one up finish your drink anytime they promise a name image and likeness episode to which I was like owned you but now we we want to have a follow up so see how long it takes yes. Uh, drink anytime they call Simone Powell the goat. God <laughs> damn it. You guys better have a whole bottle of wine the next time we do an episode because it's probably going to be the goat episode. <laughs> I've hit so many of these so far, but yes, no, I want to just, we are, we are, unless like absolutely something comes up in the next week that we cannot ignore. We are talking about Simone Biles on the next episode. So bring your chosen bottle of alcohol. We're about to have a party. <laughs> All right. He goes, allegedly, you're going to ruin all of these. So he's following up with more drink every time you apologize for not getting back to emails and promise that you're not ignoring anyone (laughs) for the record. (laughs) (laughs) I responded to every email today. Um, If you have sent us an email in the last four months, you have had a response. I apologize. I really do. Um, I actually really appreciated one of the emails that we recently got, like within the last couple of days, like I have found, and this has been a really humbling experience for me that like one of the hardest things for me to respond to when my mental health is not good, text and emails. Yep. And then what happens is I wait so long that I start to feel bad about it, that it manifests into this. Well, I can't respond now because they're going right. to think I'm an asshole, but like they already think I'm an asshole because <laughs> I didn't respond. So it just goes in a circle. So yeah, I do the same thing. I literally the other day, this was over the weekend, had two text messages from July 8th that I finally responded to. And I was like, Hey, I am really the worst. I see things. I see the messages. Then I forget about them for a few days. Then I'm like, well, now it's too late. And then I come back to say something different to whoever texts me. And then I'm like, well, sorry, I'm a jerk for not responding three weeks ago, but now I'm responding now. Mm -hmm. Also, I have another question for you. Yeah, it it helps like when I hear other people go through the same thing, because then it allows me to remember if somebody doesn't respond to me not to take it personal, because a lot of times like people are just in spaces where they're just not Mm -hmm. they're just not in a place to respond. Um, But like I said, anyone, including Sky, has received a follow up (laughs) at this point. Um, So then he added some more. Anytime a Twitter handle gets mentioned, finish your drink if if either either forgets or gets the wrong handle or forgets that's why I was laughing earlier in the show because I was like did I say your handle correctly so this is like again um have you seen the uh the like uh trend on TikTok where it's like 
um, I am the victim of a hate crime. This is not, it's from the office. The, yeah. the, the, it's like, I'm a victim of a hate crime. This is not a hate crime. Well, I, I hate didn't. it. That's <laughs> I how I feel it. about all of these. <laughs> um, anytime Sasha is too humble to plug the excellent meathead test kitchen or other cool project. And so Aaron does it for her. <laughs> That's like, yeah, I'm like the, well, I, yeah. If anyone's followed me on Twitter, it's yeah. I'm, I'm, your, just, I'm, I'm not even going to say anything now. I'm, I'm your hype. a drink of my energy drink. I'm, I'm your hype gal. Now, to be fair, God damn it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say his last one really quick. Anytime Aaron pauses and addresses the audience by going y'all, because y'all listen, uh, last Wednesday was the absolute worst day of travel for me mm. ever. Like, I mean, it was bonkers, just yeah. bonkers. I mean, I've never experienced this in my lifetime traveling that we were on the plane about ready to take off. They apparently smelled something that they didn't like. They take us back to the gate. Um, the, the mechanic doesn't like whatever's going on. So they make us deboard the plane, but here's what they never did. They never brought a new plane, nor did they ever update anything about the original plane. They just oh rebooked gosh. everyone. <laughs> so I no, managed to you. get, com. yeah, I managed to get on the very next one from Omaha to Indy. But Chris Schmidt, who handles Hill Varsity Radio, unfortunately did not get on that one and had to then fly all the way to Atlanta to get up to Indy. Um, and he didn't get into like almost 10 p.m., which it's still glad he made it to Indianapolis the day of. But like it was absolute nightmare. I never share the episode, but Sasha did. So, like, <laughs> see, here's the thing. We just we balance each other out because yes. I. And then because my like similar to emails because I didn't share it the day of I sort of feel bad about it so I just haven't shared it to this point so uh you should check out the last episode that I never That's shared good. because I'm still feeling badly about that <laughs> oh. well and I I'm so bad at checking that I sent we should add actually to this game anytime Sasha gets on Twitter because <laughs> I, I check it so infrequently. I got on this morning and I panicked that I did something wrong because I had like 20 plus notifications. And I was like, did anything else happen that I missed? Because holy cow. And Aaron That's was worse. like, no, that was about all. <laughs> no, just pretty much Simone Biles um, <laughs> is, is the goat. And we had some mailbag questions. It's totally yeah, cool. Nothing yeah. else has happened. Um, yeah, I, Yeah. I could add one and that would be every single time you could take a drink every single time I say, I swear I have this right here. I had it pulled <laughs> up, um, but I just appear to have lost it because what ends up happening is I have a lot of tabs open on my computer. And yeah. what ends up happening is I don't know if it's a tab that's open on the main se section or if I've opened an entirely new section, yeah. like if I've opened an entirely new page and then kept, like kept adding tabs to that one. So like I, yeah. The other one is promising you that I'm going to link things in the show notes because yeah. I'm going to be honest with you. What happens? I do link them. If you go to hillvarsity.com, I'll go and I'll link them. Um, but because I'm a dummy and I never just save them for myself in the moment, like I close all my tabs out. I have to then go back through my history and find them. And find it. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. You all don't know this, but you could also take a drink every single time. I promise Sasha, I will send her <laughs> a description for the show. And then several hours later, I'm like, Hey, my bad. Yeah. Here's the description several hours after I promised it to you. One more to add would be every time I'm about to swear because it's clear, it's very obvious. <laughs> And then I switch the word I'm going to use just at the last minute. So I don't have to go in and bleep it. Yeah. I've done that to <laughs> Sasha sometimes where you probably don't hear it because she edits it out, but I will tell her like, I'm about to say this word. So like, if she doesn't do that, like the best part is if you heard it, it would be like, Hey, Sasha, I'm about to say this just FYI, because then she can make a note for like to go in and bleep it out. But yeah. she probably, I assume you, I, cause I don't hear them. So I, you take that part out too, but if you left it in, it would be very funny because I'm basically <laughs> like preparing the swear word. I'm like, right. hold up okay, real quick. Audience. Warning. <laughs> Warning <laughs> for advertisers. Um, yeah, no, I love that. If you have, uh, ones that you would add as you can roast us, I'm okay with roasting. Yeah. Um, you can email us at mind your own podcast at hill Um, I've also forgotten that before, uh, <laughs> But yeah, you you can you can roast us. You can also tweet us at Aaron Sorensen at Sasha72. We'd love to hear from you. We really do we enjoy love hearing, hearing from, from you guys. I that actually made my morning this morning when I saw like it was just like all of my notifications were like listener interaction. Like 
more of that. I need to be better about like getting my ass on Twitter more often. Like, no, you don't. Maybe a couple times a week. But like speaking of mental health, like I get on there sometimes and I see where it's going and I'm like, nope, not today. I'm going to freak yeah. out and, and I'm going to piss someone off. I better just get off this stupid platform right now. It's not dumb. It serves its purpose, but I just. It's um, hard. It's hard because like even so one of the platforms that I've been a really big fan of, I've spent more time there is on, um, TikTok. Yeah. You've heard me. There you go. You can, every time Aaron brings up TikTok, (laughs) um, which you can follow me at hello, Aaron Marie, which is the same as my Instagram handle because the Aaron Sorensen handles were always taken before I could get them. Um, but like I posted a video of recently of the things that people have said to me or asked me as a woman working in sports. Mm -hmm. And trust me, it's like horrific what people will say to you. And somebody immediately commented, some random dude that was like, well, yeah, of course you were asked those things because men actually belong in this space. And I'm just going to tell you right now, I blocked that person and deleted their comment really quickly because this is one thing that I am done with. I am done allowing people into my space that don't deserve to be there. Like yep. TikTok has become a place for me that I really enjoy. And I like the community that I'm building. If you're going to come into my space and you're going to do something like that, that is not like roasting me. That is not like fun criticism. That is no. just like, in that is violating my space and putting me into a situation where I don't have to handle my own mental health because of the stupid stuff you're saying. So yeah. I am done with all of that. Um, and because of that, I just want to like, flip this back we do like you could make a drinking thing of how many times we thank you but seriously yes. like oh. i'm very appreciative of this community yeah. really really am because i don't like throw around like love the word love very often but love. i legitimately love our listeners i like, do too you I, guys are great and i think what's so cool is how diverse you all are like yeah. i don't think you all realize how diverse that you are because we have we have men and women, uh, men and women of color. We have people of all different walks of life. We have people who tell us, I love sports. I don't like sports. I, uh, I'm a fan of Nebraska. I'm not a fan of Nebraska. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like we get all kinds of emails, all kinds of, um, feedback and input. And like, that's so dang cool. And you make it so that way, when like the internet decides to be the worst, um, you make it not the worst, you you make make it it a pleasant place to be. Yeah. Well, I just want to end this by saying, email us, mind your own podcast at hillvarsity.com because I'm tired of having to open the inbox and get excited. No, we actually do get quite a (laughs) good amount of, we do get a good amount of emails, but is anyone else getting the emails that are like, are you interested in collaborating? We'll pay you $50 to put this on your website. And I'm like, no, it's not the email I wanted. <laughs> I want emails, I which want emails from the listeners. I want the listener emails, which we did just get one and I'm going to forward it to you. So yes. All right. Well, come back next week, pending any major breaking news. It is going to be the goat episode, an entire yeah. episode dedicated to Simone Biles. I'm going to spend my week watching her uh, little like docu-series on Facebook. This is, this is yeah. going to be my, this is going to be the best week ever. I'm excited too. So well, talk to you guys next week. Thanks for the ma- questions. I just almost said thanks for the mailbag. Whatever. Thanks, thanks for, for the memories. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for the memories. Been great. Talk to you next week. <laughs> Bye. A Huda Media Production.